ready? Yes. Okay, The Secret of Platform 13, Chapter 13. By the second day of watching Raymond, Bruce was thoroughly fed up. When you are a thug and used to being with gangsters, you aren't choosy, because he'd never met a boy who opened a whole box of chocolate and guzzled it in front of someone else without offering a single one. Bruce didn't like the way Raymond whined, what he looked like being beaten at Lulu's, and he thought a boy sending up to someone to give him a message where he hadn't taken any exercise was thoroughly weird. All the same, Bruce did his job. He never let Raymond out of his sight. He kept his gun in its holster. He tasted the food that was sent up in case it was poisoned. And each morning he went into the bathroom as soon as Raymond woke up to make sure that there was no drug fiends lurking behind the tub or in the toilet. Now, though he came out looking rather pale, there was something funny in there. It felt sort of cold and the curtain moved. I'm sure of it. <coughs> Doreen Trout went on knitting. She knitted as soon as she woke. This morning it was a pair of baby's booties, very pretty they were, in pink moss stitch and the steel of the needles glinted in the sun. Rubbish, she said, you're imagining things. She got up and went into the bathroom. Her empty needle flashed. She waited. No screams followed. No blood oozed from behind the pierced curtains. You see, she said, there's nobody there. But she was wrong. Mrs Partridge was there, and a nasty time she was having of it. She was a shy ghost and hated nakedness, but she'd set herself to haunt the Trotters' sleeping quarters and get the layout, and though one sight of Mrs Trotter in her underwear spraying manly through to her armpits had made her feel really sick, she was determined to stick to her job. Mrs Partridge was not the only person watching the Trotters. Cor had decided that a day spent studying their movements was necessary before a proper plan to rescue Raymond could be made. The Wernie was floating through the kitchen quarters looking for the exits, peering at the switchboards which controlled the lights. The troll called Henry, disguised as a waiter, loaded Raymond's breakfast trolley. And there were others. Down on the laundry room, an immensely sad lady had got herself taken on as a temporary laundry maid and wept a little as she counted the sheets and studied the chute which sent the dirty washing down into the basement. She didn't cry because she was particularly troubled, but because she was a banshee, and weeping is what banshees do. By 10.30, Raymond said he was bored. I want to go and buy something, he said. So the trotters went down in a lift with their bodyguards and Raymond went into the gift shop in the hotel and grumbled. They haven't got the comic I wanted and the toys are rubbish. Mrs Trotter went shopping too. She decided to buy a beautiful red rose to chuck into her bosom for dinner so that the doubles bars player would notice it and smile at her. The flower shop, though, looked different today and the lady who served in it seemed to be puzzled. Everything's taken off, she said. Look at the rubber plant. I swear it's grown a foot in the night. And that wreath, it's twice the size it was. The wreath was made of greenery and lilies. The hotel always kept leaves because a lot of the people who stayed at the Astor were old and had friends who died. Mrs Trottle bent her head to smell a lily, wondering if the double bass player would prefer her with one of those, and jerked her head back. If it wasn't impossible, she'd have said that someone had pinched her nose. Someone had. Flower fairies look much like they do in the pictures. Very, very small, with gauzy wings, but they are incredibly bad tempered because of people sticking their faces into the places where they live and sniffing. Seeing the hairy insides of someone's nostrils is not amusing. And though this particular fairy had offered to go to the astral and help Gertie, she wasn't, certainly wasn't going to be smelled. By lunchtime, the secret watchers were feeling thoroughly gloomy. It wasn't just that the bodyguards never let Raymond out of their sight. It was that Raymond himself was such a horrible boy. But it was Mellison who found out just what they were about, what, just what they were against in rescuing him. She got her uncle to move into the fall, the fountain in the palm court, and she was not having a nice time. This was because of the goldfish. In the Fortlands fountain, she'd been alone. Here, she had to share with a dozen droopy, googly-eyed, fan-tailed goldfish who flapped their tails in, their fa in her face and dirtied the water with their droppings and their food. But Mellison was a trooper. She peeped out from under the leaves. She watched Raymond and Mrs Trottle guzzle a slab of pudge, pudge cake not an hour after they'd just finished breakfast. She watched the, the daft way Mrs Trottle leered at the double bass player when the orchestra play played for the guests at tea. And she watched as Doreen Trout <coughs> came over to the fountain, sat down on the rim and, with her eyes still fixed on Raymond, out her knitting bag. 
knit two, slip one, and knit three. Then she turned slightly, so slightly that Rosalind hardly noticed it, and one of her needles plunged down into the water. It was all over in a second, and then she got up and went back to stand beside Raymond. But the fan-tailed goldfish she had speared lay floating belly up between the leaves while his life blood draining away came down on Rosalind's shocked and bewildered head. There was only one thing that cheered up the hidden watchers, and that was the cake. The cake was beautiful. The way it came in all pink and glowing from a door beside the orchestra, the balloons and streamers that came down on top of it, and the lovely girl who burst out of it and danced, tossing away her golden veils while, she, while the band played music so dreamy and romantic that it made you weep. And it was the cake which gave Paul his idea. All day the watchers had reported to him where he sat in the summer house, with his briefcase beside him, taking notes, making maps of the hotel and the street outside, and thinking. Now he was ready to speak. It was close on midnight and everyone had come to listen. The trodger had brought Miss Lund, carrying her wrapped in a wet towel, and now she sat on the bird back looking worried because she felt no one knew quite how dreadful Doreen Trout could be. The goat <coughs> hovered on the steps. The troll called Henry lay back in a deck chair eating a leek which Gertrude put into his hand. He did not care for leeks, but he cared for Gertie and was doing his best with it. Then he crept out of the crockle towers, and he and Odge were crouched on the wooden floor, watching the mist maker. Among the banshees and the flower fairies were Odge's great arms and a couple of ducks. Paul's plan, like all good plans, was simple. They would use the moment when the girl in the cake finished her dance and the light went out to capture the prince. Hans will bop him, very, very carefully, of course, using only his little finger, Drop him into the cake as it is wheeled away. No one will think of looking for him in there. But won't the girl in the cake get a shock when the prince is thrown in on top of her? Won't she squeak? asked Gertie. Paul shook his head. No, he said, because the girl in the cake won't be there. The girl in the cake will be somebody else. He looked at Gertie and under his bushy brows. The girl in the cake, said the wizard in a weighty voice, will be you. Me? Gertie blushed in a deep, a deep colour. She had always longed to come out of the cake, always, but when her mother was alive, it was no good even thinking about it. Gym mistresses who ran about blowing whistles and shouting, play up, play the game, are not likely to let their daughters within miles of the cake. You mean, trying to do that dance, the one with the seven veils? Oh, but suppose I was left standing in only, only, only me. She didn't say the word. She never had said it. Say knickers was another thing her mother had said, it's not allowed. You won't be, said Cor. The lights will go off before that, when you still have on your veil. You'll do it beautifully, Gertie, said Ben. They'll go mad for you, and everyone will be. But after that, said the troll, how will you get the prince out of the cake and away? Hans may be invisible, but Raymond won't be. If we're not allowed to use magic on him, and the cake only gets wheeled as far as the artist's dressing room, Cor nodded. But there are other things in the dressing room, such as the instruments that the players in the orchestra use. Among them is a large double bass plate. He paused and everyone looked at him expectantly, beginning to get the drift. As soon as the cake arrives in there, Hans will transfer the prince into the case of the double bass player will carry him out of the hotel by the service stairs where a van will be waiting. Surely he'll, surely he'll notice, said Ernie. Raymond must, must weigh about five times as much as a double bass. Yes, but you see, it won't be the real double bass player. It will be Mr. Prendergast. He turned to the troll. You shape-shifted yourself into a bank manager and a policeman. Surely you can manage a double best player with a black moustache and a cow's lick in the middle of his forehead. The troll nodded. No problem, he said. I got a good look at him tonight. The other details were quickly settled. Since they still had over a thousand pounds in banknotes, they were sure they could pay the real girl in the cake to get to, to let Gertie take her place. And I shall call Mrs. Crockle away with a phone message just before the cake comes in, said Paul. Or I can pretend to be the double bass player's little girl and tell the doorman that her father has to come home early. As for you, Ben, you must wait on the fire escape and signal to the van driver as soon as Raymond is packed and ready so that we can pick up against the entrance. And then off we'll go, all of us, through the gum with a whole day to spare. Then, when the jobs were given out, sighs with relief been afraid they wouldn't let him help, and he wanted more than anything to be part of the team. He felt guilty too, because he knew that Odge thought he was going with them to the island. This time you're coming, said Odge, you have to, and Ben said nothing. It was no good arguing, but you had to do what was right, and leaving Nanny Brown alone, ill as she was, couldn't ever be right. 
only he wouldn't let himself think about it he wouldn't think that he would rather go with the rescuers he wouldn't let himself think of anything except how to get Roman Tottle out of Asker and bring the king and queen their lost son.